Hey, I'm Hallie. So right now we've got the who, what, where and when of the FBI search of former President Trump's home in Florida. All we're looking for now is the why. And we may get that answer this Thursday when a federal judge holds a hearing on whether or not to unseal the affidavit behind the search. Basically, that's the document that spells out the legal justification for the whole thing that went down at Mar-a-Lago. Mr. Trump, for his part, he wants that released. He says it's in the interest of transparency. For what it's worth, we want to see it, too. News organizations like NBC are also pushing for it to be made public. But the DOJ is pushing back, telling the judge it's got to stay sealed because otherwise their investigation could get messed up. That careful approach by Attorney General Merrick Garland pretty much tracks with what we're learning today from a senior Justice Department official who says Garland took weeks to consider whether or not to get this warrant talked it out over many meetings with the top brass at Justice and the FBI. And it comes as we're hearing new details now from The New York Times that the FBI spoke with ex-White House counsel Pat Cipollone and his top deputy, Pat Philbin, about the documents taken from Mar-a-Lago, according to three people familiar with those conversations. NBC News has not verified that. And then, oh, by the way, a couple of other updates to close the loop on related to all this. We're learning the former president now has his passports back from the FBI. Remember that? And we're also learning that the top money man at the Trump organization caught up in a totally different probe is probably going to prison. NBC News has learned former Trump org CFO Alan Weisselberg is planning to plead guilty to criminal tax evasion charges, according to two people familiar with the matter. Weisselberg is expected to get a five month sentence, but is not expected to cooperate with New York's investigations into Mr. Trump himself. There you have the backdrop. So let's bring in Ken Delaney. And Ken, let's talk about this hearing coming up, because most of the time, according to experts, the government tends to win cases like this, right? Cases like this fight over the affidavit. It, so two, is there any shot we're going to see it? And if we do, is there any shot it's not just all going to be sharpied out and redacted? I hate to say this, Hallie, because our own lawyers are arguing to see this thing. And we're journalists and we would love to see it. But really, there is no shot. I mean, No one's ever seen it happen. When the government comes into court and says, Judge, we have an ongoing criminal investigation, a grand jury investigation. We're talking to witnesses. And this document lays out the whole scope of that investigation, the identities of witnesses. And even if they fuzz up the names, it would be pretty clear to people who those people were. Um, You know, investigative techniques, they said, would be compromised. So when they come to court and they say that, generally, almost always, They win, Hallie. And if they if for some reason this judge decides um, because, you know, you never know what a judge will do, that he will unseal the affidavit. The Justice Department then says they will act ask for redactions, blacking out sensitive stuff. And they said that so much of this will be redacted if they have their way, that the document will be incomprehensible. So unfortunately, I don't think we're going to see it. I do think, though, that the DOJ um, taught us a few things in their filing when they explained all this, which is that there's a big investigation going on here. It isn't just about getting the documents back. There's other issues here. They're trying to get to the bottom of how those documents got there, which would be why they would talk to a White House counsel, Pat Cipollone. They're talking to other witnesses. So there's a lot left to learn here, Hallie. By the way, too, you know, some of former President Trump's Republican allies in Congress want to see this affidavit unsealed, despite the fact that that could potentially hold some political risk if it shows something maybe damaging about Mr. Trump. Talk to us about what you're hearing related to Merrick Garland, because it seems like the Justice Department and people close to him are trying to toe the line between being appropriately careful and overly cautious here, given the many political you know, landmines that they're walking through. Yeah, I was able to confirm a report in the Wall Street Journal that Garland considered for a matter of weeks um, this decision about whether to seek this search warrant. And he met with a lot of senior officials in the department and with FBI Director Christopher Wray. Uh, And the way I look at it, that, that is exactly what you would expect anybody to do. This is one of the most momentous decisions in modern Justice Department history. And look at the impact that it's already caused. There's been an attack on an FBI office that can be traced directly back to the rhetoric uh, that, that stemmed, you know, the angry rhetoric that has stemmed from this search of people that are mad about it. So um, the real question, I think, is did the DOJ properly anticipate the consequences of this. I mean, we, you know, we've been reporting that they didn't wear their FBI windbreakers and they, they were trying to do this when Trump was out of town. Did they think that somehow it wasn't going to come out? I mean, if they did, if that was their approach, that seems a bit naive. But considering, you know, all the ins and the outs of whether to do it and how to approach it seems perfectly reasonable to me, Hallie. 
I know you've been talking with legal experts, folks who spend a lot of time in cases involving classified information, talking about the search and how former President Trump has handled documents like these. Fill us in on some of those conversations. Yeah, this goes back to the debate we've been hearing all week. You know, all these Republicans saying this is an outrageous abuse of power. I spoke with Mark Zaid, who spends his entire law practice representing intelligence officers and dealing with classified information. And he told me he's had many clients whose homes have been raided by the FBI on the mere suspicion that they possess classified information. And take a listen to what else he said. Do I think the FBI can overreach? Sure, I do. Do I think the FBI overreached in a case involving the former president of the United States on a search warrant that was personally approved by the attorney general of the United States? No. So his his point there is that um, Trump, if anything, has been granted more leeway in this case than the average intelligence community employee caught with classified information. We'll just have to see um, in the end, you know, if there are criminal charges and what that looks like, Alex. Ken Delaney, and thank you very much. To the current president now, with President Biden getting a big win of his own ahead of the midterms by signing the Inflation Reduction Act into law. That's that multi-billion dollar health care climate and tax law with the president casting the whole thing late today as one of the most significant moves in generations. Watch. With this law, the American people won and the special interests lost. Today offers further proof that the soul of America is vibrant, the future of America is bright and the promise of America is real and just beginning. OK, so now that this thing is law, what does it actually mean for you and your life and your planet and when? Right now, right right away, you're going to see a whole bunch of the climate pieces of this bill now law kick in, like tax credits. The IRS can also ramp up its staffing to handle business there. In the next few months, by January 1st, you'll see those extended health care subsidies start, along with the insulin price cap for people enrolled in Medicare. Later on, longer term, comes those negotiations with drug companies over prices. Mike Memoli is at the White House. So, ma'am, we've talked about what is coming next policy-wise. Let's talk about what comes next politics wise, because the president is really leaning on his cabinet to get out there in these you know, dog days of summer, which have not been all that slow to promote this. He himself is doing a little less of that. Explain us uh, the thinking there. Well, Hallie, there are really two factors here at play. And the first is this is what a cabinet is for. You want to divide and conquer. There's only one president. There's a lot, not just in the Inflation Reduction Act, but in this string of legislative successes that Democrats have had lately that they want to fan out to the country and really try to tout. And so you're going to see, for instance, Mayor Secretary Pete Buttigieg, Buttigieg going out there talking about the infrastructure law. You're going to see uh, Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm out there talking about the climate-related provisions of this law. You're going to see Interior Secretary Deb Holland going out to the West especially to talk about efforts here to combat drought. So this is really a divide-and-conquer strategy for the White House. But the second dynamic here, let's be real, Hallie, it is August. This president really wants a vacation. We remember what happened last August when he was trying to take a vacation. The fall of Afghanistan, Afghanistan the fall of Kabul, yeah. really did complicate the matter. So this is a White House, I tell you, Hallie, that is really determined to give the president his vacation this summer. And so he's taken a brief detour here back to the White House to sign this law. He's going to head back to Delaware in a few moments. But the White House says he'll be out there in the fall as well, attending ribbon cuttings. He'll be at a groundbreaking of a major Intel uh, factory that's expanding its uh, Round footprint in Ohio. The real question, of course, as we talk about politics, though, is will the president be there by himself or will some of those congressmen and senators who are up for election this fall want to join him to tout these successes as well? Notable, it seemed that Senator Joe Manchin was sitting there right in the front row today, <laughs> walked in by Chief of Staff Ron Klain to hammer the politics piece home a bit. Check out this poll from YouGov and The Economist. The president's approval rating, not like amazing, Right. Forty one percent approval, 55 percent of people disapprove. But the thing is, when it comes to Congress, this poll shows more people still want Democrats in control than Republicans. And listen, that is what matters in the midterms, in a midterm year. How much is the White House looking at numbers like these, ma'am, and thinking about those when they're putting together this strategy? Well, it's funny you mentioned Senator Joe Manchin. He was just holding court a short walk up here. You know the geography of the White House I, I with sure reporters do. after the fact. And he was talking about the conversation he was having behind closed doors today with President Biden, talking about whether maybe he would come to West Virginia. And, and Biden, the president, joked, you know, I'll come in there. I'll go with you or against you, whatever helps you most. And that's really the attitude 
of the White House <laughs> as it relates to Democrats on the ballot this fall. The president is certainly going to be there if they want him in their districts. Uh, but I've often seen in some of the travels I've done with the president this year that in his remarks, often he is really singling out ways in which sometimes Democrats have fought him on policies or things that they really tried to get in a bill that maybe he wasn't necessarily on board with at first. He's trying to walk that fine line here to allow Democrats to demonstrate some independence from the White House when they need to, uh, but also to really bring that extra added oomph, especially for a White House that thinks they do have some political me momentum at this point. Allie. Mike Memoli on the North Lawn there. Ma'am, thank you. Talking to midterms now, there's a movie reference that sources tell me people close to Liz Cheney like, involving a little indie film called Star Wars. Okay, this Washington Post op-ed recently framed Cheney as Obi-Wan Kenobi, who is, of course, initially defeated, but then ultimately is part of the force that takes down Darth Vader, or in this analogy, Donald Trump. And that gives you a sense of how some in Cheney's circle are casting tonight the Wyoming primary as the start of a bigger and broader, almost galactic battle for the future of the Republican Party, because Cheney will almost certainly lose. And that's not me saying it. That's polling. Right. You see a recent one here. She is down by something like 20 plus points here at high risk of losing her seats. Which is why some see her as a potential political martyr. And then in Alaska, you have Senator Lisa Murkowski, also somebody who voted to impeach former President Trump and a Trump target. We'll have a report from Anchorage in just a minute, but I want to first go to Vaughn Hilliard, who is posted up for us in Wyoming. And listen, it is an uphill battle for Liz Cheney, but also, you know, she gets that, I think, Vaughn, right? She is clear eyed about her chances there. And I think she and her team are already looking ahead to the next steps. Right. I, I think another metaphor we could run with, Hallie, or is essentially if we're talking about an uphill climb, we're talking about the Teton Mountain Range, just about five miles from where we're standing here right okay. now. And quite frankly, trying to scale the Tetons uh, ain't an easy feat. And one may have to figure out a way to go around it here, because if you're Liz Cheney, you're staring at a likely defeat here tonight. Frankly, the numbers, it's just hard to get to the point where you know, you're able to see a victory for her. Even if she's able to bring over uh, Democrats who registered as Republicans today here, this in large part is figuring out how to remain influential uh, in American politics beyond tomorrow. Now, her folks have said, look, this is, primary battle is just the first of a much larger, longer fight that she intends to make to take on Donald Trump and make sure they never get in the White House again. But it's a, it's a really difficult case to make, Hallie. We've got to be frank about this because these are her own neighbors, her own backyard here, the folks that have known the Cheney family for five decades now who are on the cusp of potentially saying, we don't want you in the United States Congress anymore. And that's a piece of this, too. The, the Cheney, the Bush Cheney, if you will, but specifically in Wyoming, the Cheney dynasty coming to a close potentially today, this week in Wyoming. And the theme here, and we're going to talk about it more in a second when we get a live or get a report from, from Anchorage, Alaska, with Lisa Murzkowski and Sarah Palin. The theme here is... Donald Trump has done well in many, not all, but many of these Republican primaries with people who are riding the MAGA wave, if you will, right? The wave of support for him. It is showing that those Republicans in power who buck former President Trump tend to not do well. Now, that, again, right. that's not a blanket statement. Lisa Murkowski might very well prove that wrong in Alaska. She probably will. Um, but this is the this is kind of a, a new era, not just in Wyoming politics, but potentially in the party at large. And I think that that's why Wyoming is kind of the epitome of all this, and I think it's the perfect example to it. I'll mm -hmm. tell you, I think it was earlier this summer when I was standing at uh, the Trump-Hageman rally in Casper, Wyoming, uh, an arena of probably about 10,000 folks, and that's where it was wild to just turn around and look at this arena in the heart of what used to be Bush-Cheney country. In 20 years later, less than 20 years later, you're talking about chance of firing Liz, ditch Liz, get rid of the old GOP, Right. And it's almost if you look at 2008 in that potential handover of the Bush Cheney to McCain Palin. I mean, who would have thought, right, it, that it was ultimately the Sarah Palin wing, inspired wing of the party, the Tea Party, that would ultimately transcend that old wing of the GOP, then lead us here in 2022, in which there is we're having conversations about the new right, about the America first agenda and about the prominence of Donald Trump being able to go back and help potentially lift up the likes of Sarah Palin and take down the likes of Liz Cheney. There's a lot that can happen within one political party in America at this moment in time right now, Hallie. 
Vaughn Hilliard live for us. Uh, I know you'll be watching all those returns come in tonight from Wyoming. Appreciate it. We talked about what happened, of course, out west, what's happening tonight. But there's also Alaska, where Sarah Palin is trying to make her return to Washington, specifically to the Capitol, to the political stage. And Senator Lisa Murkowski, somebody who former President Trump has targeted in the past, is looking to hold on to her seat. Ali Vitale is there. A lot of races for voters to make their picks in and a whole new way of them making those picks with a ranked choice voting system that applies to this House race to succeed the late Congressman Don Young, who passed away in March. Whoever wins this Tuesday election is going to finish out the rest of his term until January. The November election will then decide who takes that full term for the next two years. But look, a lot of household names in that race, people like Sarah Palin, a former vice presidential candidate, trying to make a national electoral comeback. She's been on the ballot here before, though, and voters say they know what she's done as a mayor in Wasilla and then, of course, as governor of the state. To them, that's enough to make their decision off of. And for some voters, it's not enough. Look, I know a lot of people have problems with the way that she supposedly quit and went away. There were some legal problems there. Um, That's not really where my focus is. Mine's more about ACEs and the fact that we took a long time to walk that back. Oil production in Alaska has not been very great since then. And so she just wasn't really good for Alaska. And look, Palin's opponents are hitting her on that, too. The fact that she's got this national name ID, her name here is what she's campaigning on, but she's not necessarily campaigning around the state. That's something her opponents are seizing on, pointing out the fact that she has spent these critical weeks before Election Day off the campaign trail in Alaska while campaigning in other places, even as her opponents are taking to the campaign trail here all over this massive state. Someone else who's making the rounds here, too, though, is Senator Lisa Murkowski. She's up for her own Senate Republican primary. Again, a crowded field here. But in the Murkowski primary, all she's got to do is place top four to make it on the ballot in November. We expect her to do that. But of course, it's despite the fact that Donald Trump has railed against her, listing her as one of his top midterm targets, endorsing one of her challengers. But Murkowski is no stranger to a tough reelection battle. At least her campaign says they feel good, at least about this first decision day, although November, that's going to be the big one. Ali Vitale for us there in Anchorage. Today, the federal government is telling Arizona and Nevada for the first time that those states have to cut way back on how much water they use from the Colorado River. And they've got to do that soon, starting next January. This river is a key source of water for a lot of the southwestern states and Mexico. And today, the government has now officially alerted that it's at what's called a tier two shortage. What does that mean? It means water levels are way down because of so much drought. Arizona is going to be hit hard by these forced cuts. It's set to lose 21 percent of the water it typically gets from the river. Think about that, right? It's like a fifth of the water it normally has gone, wiped out. Separately, today was also the deadline the government set for seven states to agree amongst themselves on how to divvy up water and these future water cuts. There is no sign of a deal on that. Raf Sanchez has posted up out west and joins us now. These cuts for Arizona and Nevada, these dam cuts are automatic. Explain for people who don't live out west, like how significant this is, how this actually works, right? How logistically this works and the impact this is going to have on farmers, the agricultural belts out there, etc. Yeah, Hallie, this is unprecedented. The Colorado Water River provides water for about 40 million Americans here in the West, and we have never seen it as low as it is right now. As you said, Arizona is going to lose a fifth of its water allocation from the river. Just to give you a sense of how much that is, it's about as much as the city of L.A. uses every single year. That is a lot of water. Nevada is going to lose about 8 percent of its allocation. And as you said, it's going to be farmers who are hardest hit. About 90 percent of winter vegetables in the United States are grown here in the West. So, Hallie, if you're in D.C., you're eating a salad in February. It's pretty likely that lettuce was grown out here. And farmers right now are looking around and they are trying to figure out how are they going to produce those vegetables with a fifth less water than what they had going into this year? Hallie? For for the Western states that missed this deadline to have like a, you know, discussion about future water cuts, what happens now? Does the government come in and say, hey, you couldn't figure it out. We're going to figure it out for you. 
pretty much. The federal government has some carrots and some sticks here. The sticks, they are threatening to basically come here to the West and start banging heads together at the state leadership level to just impose cuts on these states if they can't agree amongst themselves. Washington is pretty reluctant to do that. They would really, really prefer that these states reach a consensus. They do have some carrots. They've got some money that they can use to try to induce these states, try to smooth along an agreement. But I'll tell you, Holly, there is real frustration here in the West that state leadership can't get to a deal on this. This is a classic political situation. Everybody agrees painful cuts need to happen. Nobody can agree about how those cuts need to be distributed. I was speaking earlier to Kyle Rohrink. He runs a conservation group out here. Take a listen to what he had to say about this. We have to be in a position where we are uh, preparing for the worst and, and hoping for the best. And uh, I think, you know, this week will be a good time to rattle some cages and hopefully get folks back to the table. And Hallie, of course, these cuts that are being talked about are basically the bare minimum to avoid a disaster right now. But with climate change, there's only ever going to be less water. That's and so right. this is going to be a fight about how to divide the pain among an ever shrinking amount of water. Hallie? It's such a huge issue. And it is, as you say, Raf, it is an unprecedented move. Never been done before. Thank you so much for your reporting live from us out there in L.A. Coming up after Ezra Miller's apologizing for their behavior saying they're seeking treatment for mental health issues after some people on social media started calling for the Flash movie to get canceled. We'll get into it. Plus, what the NBA is doing to encourage fans to vote in this year's midterms. We'll be right back. The NBA is now leading what's being called the biggest political effort the sports world has ever seen. You know what they're doing? There's not going to be any NBA games played on Election Day this year. None. Instead, the league is hoping fans, the league employees, players are going to take the opportunity to take that day and vote in the midterms. A full day off without games is a big deal during the NBA regular season that normally only happens on Thanksgiving and during the All-Star break. In an NBC News exclusive interview, the league's head of social justice coalition told our Shaq Brewster why this is so important to the league. Voting on Election Day are obviously unique and incredibly important to our democracy, and that's part of the uh, the, the value uh, proposition that we want to make sure people understand that you know, voting is unlike anything else. Shaq is joining us now. Shaq, uh, I know you scooped the story for us here at NBC News, and it's so interesting because the NBA, it seems, is creating this culture of political participation. We've seen sort of athletic activism before, I think back to 2020, and the Black Lives Matter support that the NBA was letting players be vocal about after the George Floyd murder. That's exactly right, Hallie. And the decision and announcement that we heard from the NBA today is in direct uh, contrast. It's a, a, a next step in what we saw back in 2020. You mentioned it was not only the George Floyd protest, but after when you had in Kenosha the shooting of Jacob Blake, the NBA season was nearly derailed. And in the wake of that, you saw this social justice coalition formed. And this is the group that's behind this decision now to have no games behind uh, or on Election Day. And in addition, to that, the day before the election, have 30 teams, all 30 teams compete on election day to encourage fans to participate in the election the next day. So this is all combined. You know, one thing that we see from NBA players and the teams, they push policy measures, they push things like the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. But that through line that you always hear from them is that in order to get those measures passed, you need to show up at the polls. This is the NBA trying to get more people to show up at the polls. The league has some other irons in the fire, too. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's not it. As I mentioned, you'll have the day before election uh, day, you'll have all 30 teams competing. They're calling this a civic engagement night. What that looks like specifically is still uh, yet to be determined. It's going to be by each individual team deciding what they want to do. But one thing that we're already seeing is this push for voter registration. Right there where you are in Washington, D.C., for example, the Washington Wizards and Washington Mystics are teaming up together to have voter registration at every game. They're going to make that a priority from now, from this point 
up until and through the election. You're seeing that from other teams. One thing that we saw in 2020 was many of the teams turned some of the venues like the one I'm standing at right now. They turn these arenas and team facilities into actual voting locations or locations to train poll workers. NBA officials tell me they're trying to do that again this time around. It's a little bit harder without the COVID pandemic uh, looming and uh, as prevalent as it was before. They're trying to do that this time around, but uh, there, there are a couple of uh, announcements that they have left uh, in, their, in their back pocket. Uh, it is historically, objectively nonpartisan to say to people, go out and vote, exercise your democratic yeah. right and cast a ballot, right? The league isn't saying necessarily go vote for Democrats or go vote for Republicans. They're saying just go out and, and go and, and do this civic duty. Are they getting any backlash for it, Jack, or, or are people um, sort of seeing what the league's trying to do? Yeah, that was a point that the executive director emphasized in my conversations with him, that he is not telling people how to vote or saying that they should vote one way or the other. It's a nonpartisan organization. They just want people to go out and cast that ballot. But when you talk about the backlash, I mean, there is always a potential for backlash on a measure like this when you have a league getting involved in politics. Uh, people make assumptions about what uh, direction they want NBA players to go into or what direction the NBA wants voters to make. You know, that was something I did ask the executive director and listen to his response when I asked about the potential and the risks for backlash. It's always a reality. Not everybody's going to like everything that you do, but you don't do impact work by referendum. You do it because you think it matters and because you think it represents the values of the organizations and the folks that, 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 that we report to. You know, I did have conversations with people who observe the NBA, who cover the NBA on a regular basis. And one point that they made to me is that there is not that much risk here because this is a sweet spot for this league. These are players who have been involved in the past. Their fans expect their players to be involved for an issue like voting, especially when they're not saying which way you should vote. They say this is a uh, part in the pun, but this came from him. It's a slam dunk for the lead to do something like this. Oh, Shaq, I know you cannot resist a pun. Thank you. I appreciate you. Appreciate your reporting and, and bringing that scoop to us. Thanks. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, the U.S. military test fired a Minuteman three intercontinental ballistic missile overnight. It was not armed. And an official said the test was meant to show the readiness of U.S. nuclear forces. This is a test that had been delayed from earlier this month to avoid any kind of increased tensions with China over Taiwan. Number two, American Airlines says it's ordered 20 supersonic planes. They can carry people at twice the speed of the fastest commercial plane right now. Think Miami to London in less than five hours, LA to Honolulu in three. United and Japan Airlines have also ordered some of these planes. The company that makes them says passengers could be flying in them by the end of the decade. So not tomorrow, but not in 100 years. Number three, the FDA says it's letting hearing aids be sold over the counter without a medical exam or without a prescription. The agency says they could be available online and in drugstores for people who have mild to moderate hearing problems as early as the middle of October. Officials say they hope this is going to make the devices more accessible and cheaper, too. Right now, if you don't have insurance, they can cost thousands of dollars. Number four, Kraft Heinz is recalling thousands of cases of a favorite kid drink, Capri Sun, saying the pouches might be contaminated with a cleaning solution. In a statement, the company said the solution is used on some of the equipment to process food. It was accidentally introduced into a production line at one of its factories. Wild cherry is the only affected flavor, but if you have it, be careful. Number five, there's a fundraiser in Norway that's raised more than $16,000 so far to build a statue to honor Freya. She's the famous walrus we told you about earlier this month who liked to jump on people's boats for a nap. Sometimes she sunk the boats. Over the weekend, officials there euthanized the 1,300-pound walrus over concerns about her welfare and the risk she posed to the crowds who ended up coming to see her. Actor Ezra Miller is speaking up for the first time about some concerning behavior that's been all over the headlines lately. In a statement provided to NBC News by their spokesperson, the 29-year-old says they're going to get treatment for complex mental health issues after what they call a time of intense crisis. We know Miller's gotten into some legal trouble recently, charged with burglary and disorderly conduct in Vermont and Hawaii. They're also facing allegations of grooming, abuse, intimidation. Miller's spokesperson has previously declined to comment on that. 
These controversies have become not just a legal issue, but a PR one, not only for Miller, but for Warner Brothers Discovery. Miller is a big part of one of the company's big franchises, DC Comics. They're starring as The Flash in that movie coming out next summer. We've reached out to Warner Brothers Discovery for a comment, but have not yet heard back. Kristen Dahlgren joins us now. And Kristen, there's been a lot of scrutiny over, you know, this movie that reportedly cost something like $200 million and having the face of it be somebody who is involved um, or facing some of these potential legal troubles. But there's still no indication Warner is actually doing anything, right, or taking any action on that. Right. So, you know, as you said, this is a big budget film, a big deal. It's uh, due to be released as of now in theaters June 23rd, 2023. So a little less uh, than a year away, just to give you some idea how big it is. Ben Affleck, Michael Keaton back as Batman uh, making appearances in this film. So a lot of money spent on this. And even as recently as last week, there was some there were some reports uh, that Warner Brothers was considering a couple of different options for the film, including potentially uh, shelving it. There have been all of these calls for them to can Ezra Miller and move on uh, from them as the Flash. And uh, Warner Brothers CEO has publicly said that he's very excited about the film. And, uh, you know, today's statement from Ezra Miller really makes this a new day. And I was struck by one what, what one executive was quoted as saying in Deadline, and I think we have a full screen of this. He said, this isn't about business. It's about a human being who is clearly in pain. So it's important to look at this statement from Miller today and also note that they said they were apologizing to anyone uh, and everyone that they have alarmed. And continuing, I'm committed to doing the necessary work to get back to a healthy, safe and productive stage. So kudos to them for that. A big personal step, but also potentially a big PR step in uh, rescuing this film, or at least their role in this film, Hallie. And as far as what brought us to this sort of moment and this announcement today, Chris, and you look at these legal issues, they date back months. Right. So, you know, back in March, uh, arrested in Hilo, Hawaii. That was for disorderly conduct, also second degree assault. August 9th, felony burglary charges here uh, in Vermont. They also appear to have choked a woman in Iceland. There is video of that. No charges were filed there. So a lot of different legal woes spanning uh, different countries. There is a September court date in Vermont. So those legal woes uh, continue. But today, Ezra Miller saying uh, that they are seeking this continuing treatment. And it appears to be now uh, that some of these legal woes may be a result of severe mental illness. Hallie. Kristen Dahlgren, thank you very much for that reporting. When we come back, some TikTokers with tens of millions of followers now turning on Amazon over labor practices. How the company is now responding after the break. In Florida, a vacation became a nightmare for one family when a shark bit their 10-year-old. We'll talk about how he's doing coming up in the local. But first, a bunch of TikTokers, like 70 of them. They're saying they are done with Amazon as part of a new campaign they're calling People Over Prime. These folks, these influencers, are saying they're going to close their online storefronts. They're going to stop new partnerships until the company steps up and meets the demands of the Amazon labor union. What are those demands? A $30 minimum wage, more time off, the end of what they see as union busting activities. And we're talking about creators who have some clout. They have a combined following of more than 51 million people. OK, that's a, that's a lot of reach. It comes as the company is seeing more and more attempts, basically, at organized labor. Just in the last 24 hours, we saw something like 150 people walk out of the San Bernardino hub over concerns about low wages and like physical safety. They're hot. The heat. They're not comfortable. Amazon says it was fewer people who actually walked out. Workers are organizing in other cities, too. But Amazon's pushed back. They've been accused of illegally firing and even calling the cops on some workers who show support for unions. NBC News reached out to Amazon and its union for comment. No response yet. But I do want to bring in Jake Ward, who's following all of this. So this people over prime campaign, Jake, these are people with big followings on TikTok. But Amazon, you know, arguably, when you look at its customer base, has a huge following. If you're going to count people who buy from them as followers. Right. I mean, they're the second biggest private company in the country. How big of a problem is this for them? 
Well, it's really interesting, Holly, because as you say, right, if you're looking at it in the sheer, you know, success, right, of a retailer like Amazon, there's almost no company in the world in the history of capitalism that has been as successful as this company. But it sees the future. This has always been the great gift of Jeff Bezos trying to get out in front of what's coming. And one of the things that is coming is the incredible influence of online creators like the people who have amassed, as you say, about 51 million people together as followers on TikTok. And, you know, the fact that these folks are pulling out of their support for Prime is really interesting, not least because Amazon has actively courted these people for years, for about five years now. Amazon has run an influencer program. They basically get a cut of storefronts that they run, and if they make a recommendation in a TikTok to their audience, and the audience buys something, they can get 10% here for a beauty product, 20% there for an online game. They've, in fact, flown influencers out to a sort of resort retreat at Toto Santos, uh, uh, they did that last year and, and you know, treated them, wined them and dined them, uh, you know, throughout about a three-day period where they could sort of foster a sense of community and bring them all together. So they obviously see that the reach here, and not just the reach, but the ability to find really engaged, really, you know, fanatical, right, the word that fans comes from, and very specifically targeted audiences by going through influencers is really the wave of the future when it comes to marketing. And the fact that these folks are now using that same power to say instead, no, no, we are pro-labor and anti-Amazon. On. That's a very big deal for this company, I think. What's also interesting here is the way that we've seen TikTok become this platform for, for pro-union advocacy, not just with Amazon, but we saw it with Starbucks, for example, um, other places over the last few months. It feels like it is a combination of the accessibility and connectivity, but also of a younger generation, the people who tend to use TikTok. I don't mean to sound like an old lady and call them the youngs, but like, you know what I mean? The people who are tend to be younger on TikTok, who are generally more pro-union. Well, it is interesting, right? And I agree with you. I hate being the person having to say, you know, the youth I know. of today. I hate that. I hate that. I hate that. I feel like a gross, that's exactly, totally. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. But this is really true. I mean, right, just to sort of like spell out the incredible power of TikTok. Right now, the reason that Facebook and Snapchat and all these companies are watching TikTok is because when you look at individual apps and their use by young people, the individual apps, their numbers are falling among young people consistently. All young people are basically using fewer and fewer social media apps, except for TikTok. TikTok is the one that is continuing to grow among young people. So that's a huge deal. And you're right. There's this whole genre of pro-labor, pro activism uh, sort of TikTok posts, you know, when I'm scrolling through and it shows me how to make this delicious piece of food or here's a guy who, you know, fixed his own car, then it'll show me this, you know, iconic uh, uh, post, one of them, uh, as of a woman quitting her job at Walmart, going on the mic and decrying the conditions of working there. You have people giving lessons in Marxist theory. I mean, it's really incredible just what a sort of genre that has become. And so it seems to have traction among people. We are, of course, in the midst of what we're calling the great resignation, the great reshuffling, whatever you want to call it. But people do not want the jobs that are on offer right now. And perhaps some of the sort of ideological shift that we are seeing in this country may be coming from TikTok. Mm. Maybe that's part of it. Jake Ward, it's always great to have these conversations. Thank you for bringing us up to speed on that reporting. Coming up, it is back to school time, but not for everyone. We are, have a really desperate situation. We're going to head to a district in Florida to look at what exactly is fueling this teacher crisis, this teacher shortage. Plus, a rollover rescue caught on camera. Look at this, how some strangers work together to save a driver's life. That's next in The Local. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. From our Northeast Bureau, Massachusetts State Police are still looking for a missing 21-year-old after he jumped off a popular Martha's Vineyard bridge made famous in the movie Jaws. Officials say he and his brother jumped late Sunday. They found the brother's body yesterday. From our Southeast Bureau, a 10-year-old boy lost part of his leg after he was attacked by a shark in the Florida Keys this weekend. On Facebook, the boy's uncle said he and his family had been snorkeling in a shallow reef when the shark bit him. His uncle said doctors had to amputate below the knee to save his life. 
also from our Southeast Bureau. A group of Good Samaritans stepping in to rescue a driver after his car crashed and rolled over on a highway in San Antonio. Look at this. They say they flipped the car over, then they bust open the window. They're about to do it. They, they break open the window to get the driver out. One witness said the driver was taken away in critical condition. This week, NBC News is looking at kids under pressure, digging into how inflation and rising costs are making it tougher for families and schools across the country. And I know you've heard this headline right now. You've probably seen it on social media, this teacher crisis, this teacher shortage. The Bureau of Labor Statistics estimates about 300,000 public school teachers and staffers left their jobs altogether since the start of the pandemic, a nearly 3 percent drop in that workforce. Education Secretary Miguel Cardona was on MSNBC today talking about it. Watch. Uh, we need to make mm-hmm. sure we're uh, respecting the profession, and that means competitive salaries, better working conditions, and teacher voice as we reimagine schools. One school in Florida has a new way of recruiting teachers. They're getting a little bit creative. NBC's Stephen Romo has that story. Do you accept? Yes. Awesome. Thank awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our newest teacher at Haines City High School. High school principal Adam Lane has become a pro at recruiting new teachers. My brown eyed good. When he's not serenading his staff, he's busy crafting a pipeline of teachers for his school. It's a strategy he's deployed to combat Florida's teacher shortage with about 9,500 vacancies. So we really work with our seniors to come back to Haines City High School to build a life and a future and an education right here on the place they graduated from. This year, we're bringing in 27 new staff members. Very excited. They say 15 of those positions will be teachers and teaching assistants, a third of which are alumni. I came back here and I became a full-time sub, and and that's when I really got hooked on on wanting to come back here and being a full-time teacher. The Haynes City High hiring spree isn't happening at many schools across the country. According to National Center for Education Statistics projections, about 50,000 fewer new teachers were hired in 2022 compared to last year. The center also estimates that there will be approximately 33,000 fewer teachers across the nation by the end of the year. Some experts say that a shaky economy and high inflation Make those numbers no surprise. We have a really desperate situation, and I think that has everything to do with the way these jobs are compensated. Teachers make nearly 20% less than their peers in other occupations. We don't have a shortage of people who are certified to be teachers. We have a shortage of people who are teachers and certified who are willing to work for the low pay and then take on a lot of the responsibilities that are being thrown at them and really bad policy that is making the job that much harder. And therefore, people are walking away from the profession in record numbers. A June report by the National Education Association found that teachers are making more than $2,100 less on average than they did 10 years ago when adjusted for inflation. Because of the federal relief and recovery funds, state and local governments have the money to raise pay and hire teachers back. They are resisting doing that. For teachers like Camille, the reality of low wages is something she's used to being warned about. There were so many things that people were saying, you know, maybe education isn't such a good idea because of pay or maybe the students, but that wasn't exactly something that I thought was a problem. But luckily for her students, that hurdle did not stop Camille from pursuing her passion. If someone was having thoughts in possibly becoming a teacher or not, I would say jump in it. If you don't try it, then you'll never really know if it's meant for you. Stephen is joining us now. And Stephen, this whole issue of retention and teachers, it's, it's not just Florida's problem when it comes to teachers who say they are underpaid. Over in Colorado, you have housing costs pricing teachers out. Apparently, teachers can only afford something like one in five homes in the state, according to Colorado Public Radio. There's been this discussion, I think, for a long time about how you know, for the service that teachers do for the kids in our communities, they should be paid like doctors. You know, they should be paid. They should be paid way more than they're being paid now. 
Yeah, especially considering just exactly how much influence they have on these kids, Hallie. In Colorado, as you mentioned, it really illustrates part of the problem. 20% of all homes there considered affordable now. That's down from 38% uh, in 2020, according to a study from the Keystone Policy Institute. Well, that study also classified homes affordable when a teacher's monthly housing cost would not surpass 30% of their monthly pay. That study, first reported by Colorado Public Radio, also said 17% of teachers there are leaving their positions at the end of the school years, many opting to move, and understandably so. They want to be able to live in a nice place. And it's not just Colorado. There are reports of people quitting teaching and taking jobs in retail, like a Business Insider report of an Ohio teacher quitting and going to work at Walmart, where he ended up making more money, about $12,000 more a year than he did in his teaching job. Just a mm. couple of examples of how this problem is playing out in so many parts of the country. Allie? And we haven't even talked about this whole other movement on social media to help clear the lists, it's called, right, and get teachers the school yeah. supplies that they need for their classrooms that they're paying for out of pocket. There's a lot there. Stephen Romo, thank you. Good to see you. Appreciate all of you watching us this hour. We're going to have more for you here tomorrow on NBC News Now. Same time, same place. Coverage picks up right now.